Hi, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. Available in video format at FunkinStuff.net and on YouTube, Truth and Rhythm can now also be enjoyed on the go in its audio podcast version on iTunes and from other leading providers. I am your host, Scott Dr. Jiggs Goldfine, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guy to Funk. If you don't have your copy, you better get it. Whether you're watching or listening, as always, I thank you very much for your continued support. And you're rewarded today, once again, because my guest is prolific funk drummer Frankie Cashwadi, the beekeeper on a gang of recordings by the Parliament Funkadelic Empire, particularly Bootsy's Rubber Band. Hailing from Ohio's funk bed area of Cincinnati, Cash was a member of Bootsy and his brother Catfish's band, The Pacemakers which also included singer Felipe Wynn of the eventual Spinner's fame, and later a prominent vo uh, vo voice on Funkadelic's monster hit, Not Just New Heat. The Pacemakers became JB's backing band for a landmark year between 1970 and 71. That's when the Godfather of Soul unleashed classics like Get Up, I Feel Like Being a Sex Machine, Super Bad, Soul Power, Talking Loud and Saying Nothing, and the instrumental The Grunt. Unfortunately, due to certain circumstances, Cash is only credited with the latter track. The Collins brothers and Cash went on to form a band called The House Guests, and that band captured the attention of George Clinton. Beginning with Funkadelic's 1972 album, America, Eat, America Eats Its Young, that's a copy right there, CD. Right. Cash embarked on a long, winding, and amazing road with P Funk. Although he is all over the funk mob's vast catalog, his most consistent post has always been as a member of the rubber band, providing the backbeat for all of Bootsy's great jams in the studio and on stage. I'm speaking of songs like Stretching Out, I'd Rather Be With You, The Pinocchio Theory, Hollywood Squares, Bootzilla, Rotorooter, Jam Fan, and so many others. There's no doubt that Cash has been a key pacemaker to the rhythm of my life for decades. I spent all that time funking to so many of those great tracks. So with all that cash, so glad to have you today. How are you, man? Great, great, great stuff, man. You've you done your research. <laughs> and, and not, not only research, uh, you could tell that you put a lot of your, a lot of your life is in, invested in that, you know, and, and that makes me feel great, man, that, that we could mean that much to you. Um, I am Frankie Cashwaddy, funky drums and things. Forever funking on, baby. Absolutely. Happy to be here. And Frank, you're coming to us from Los Angeles, is that right? That's right. We're actually in Encino, Encino, California. All right, San Fernando Valley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I, I was spent most of my life out there. I was in. Uh, well, I grew up in the valley, and then mm -hmm. I went to high school out in Santa Monica, mm -hmm. and then yeah. uh, just came out here to the Charlotte area about ten years ago. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I know I know it well. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully you're cooling off a little bit. <laughs> yeah, man. We needed it. It was a triple digit thing is not a it's not a great look for, for the West Coast, especially if it's if if it's humidity, because we're not used to humidity out here, you know, with heat. Yeah, that could <clears throat> that could uh, inhibit you from pounding the drums, I'm guessing, if it gets that hot. Uh I don't know. I don't I don't let nothing stand in the way of that too much. You know, I I played under some pretty uh, crazy conditions in situations, you know, and, and, and I, you know, I, I don't, you, you don't think about it until ap maybe a little bit before, but you focus before and then you might think about it after, you know, wow, man, it was really hot or wow, it was really cold. What I do is uh, I'll tell my, uh, my drum techs to, especially we're doing outside open air stuff, I say, listen, uh, it's very sunny out, so, you know, the drums are tuned perfectly. Please cover each drum with a towel, preferably white, so that it reflects the sun and it won't change the tuning of the drums mm. because that heat will, you know, it'll, it'll change the tuning of the drums. And the same with cold. The same with cold. You can either go flat or sharp, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, but I, I, as far as physically, personally, I don't, you know, you, you can't get too caught up in the worrying about that and thinking about it, you know. The same with sickness. If I'm real sick or, 
and, and, and it's really amazing to me to this day. Like if I got a bad flu or a bad cold or something like that, man, it bothers me up to the t I start playing and after I play, not during. Fun cares, it's like, man. It, it, Fun cares. It's, like, it's like good medicine. It's good medicine, you know. Yeah. And uh and it's make I could be dog dog down sick. I mean all the way dog butt sick, you know, and like when I once I start playing, you know, it's like it, it just doesn't exist, you know. And then when I stop, it hits me again, you know, bam. And I was like, oh, okay, there it is, you know. But but uh yeah, uh give you a quick story. Um years ago we were starting out a tour in uh Nashville, Tennessee, <clears throat> rubber band, which I'm co-founding member of the rubber band. And uh I was horsing around with Bernie Warrell and Gary Scheider. And it's ironic, Gary Scheider, the day before, a couple of days before, Bernie Warrell broke his foot or ankle, horsing around with Gary Scheider. And in the next couple of days, Gary Scheider sprang his ankle real bad. And then right after that, I tore a ligament in my foot, in my plane, my kick, my, my bass drum foot, which is major, you know. And uh, it was, man, I, 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 I can't explain. All I can tell you is try very hard not to ever tear a ligament. But, but uh, what it did was, um, uh, once again, here I am in excruciating pain, can't hardly move, I'm immobile, almost I got a cane, I got crutches, I'm being helped along, I got to do these days, it's a brand new tour, we're scorching hot, and uh, the only thing I could do was play. The only thing I could do was play. When, when I got finished playing, my drum tech would lift me up in his arms like a little baby and carry me off stage. Wow. It's Greg, Greg Black, I swear to God, Greg Black. And uh, I would, I, they actually had to give me a, a different set of, of itineraries because my leaving time had to be different from everybody else's because it would take me so long to get to the bus, I would make the bus late. You know, I mean, I was really in bad shape, you know, but I could play. But what, I could play. What year about was that, Frankie? Uh, you would do that one. 70s, though? And there, yeah, 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 early on, you know, and um, I, uh, it was so profound to me because I'm suffering this thing and I knew that it had to be some type of blessing that the only thing I could do is play and, and I could play good. You know, I left it alone, man. I didn't question it. I didn't try to find, figure out why. I knew it was bigger than me. It was, it was from a higher being, and it was phenomenal because everybody, all the guys, all, all, all the guys in the group, they knew I was in bad shape, but they had watched me play in awe. They couldn't, they they couldn't believe. It. Neither could I, you know. But that just goes to show you that it is good medicine. What, what we said before. You know? How 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 did you get injured like that? Parsing around with Bernie Warrell oh. and Gary Scheider. <laughs> you know what I, you know what I did. You know what I did. We were wearing platforms and all this stuff, right? Oh, yeah. I was a platform boots and I stepped on a PA card cord, um, which is like that, you know, and when I stepped on the cord, my foot wobbled and when it wobbled, I heard it pop. Yeah. I heard it snap. Pop. I said, oh, okay, now it's time to go on now. It's right before the show. So I couldn't focus on it too much. Man, my foot was killing me. When I came off stage, it was a done deal. Ironically, uh, we were going back to Cincinnati for a little off time. And Boosie and I rode in the car together, me and him just riding and talking. And uh, by the time I got to Cincinnati to my, house, to my home, I went to step out of the car. And when I went to put my foot down on the pavement, my foot did like this. You know, it's almost like my foot was like, let me know, you know, might not want to do that, you know. And uh, I had to cut the boot off my, my foot. <laughs> It's swollen to that degree. I went to the hospital and they thought that it was a fracture and they were getting ready to put a cast on it. And uh, I said, oh, wow, not now. So to show you how irony works, I didn't get the cat, but the, 
But if it had been a, a, a break, it would have been the best thing because it would have been cut and dry, you know, break, put it back together, heal up, bam, you know. Ligament, wow. Worst thing ever, because first of all, those fibers, they have to mend back together. As, you never mend back 100% the same, but as closely as, as the same as possible. And uh, it takes a little longer, and it's very painful all the way through. But, yeah. but, but the irony to the story is, I could play. I could play very, very well, and that's all I could do. Wow. So I, was pit- I was pitiful. I was literally pitiful until I got behind the drums. And then I, you know, I, was, you know, I was a basket case, but, but it's good medicine, man. And, and, and that's something you can tell by the way I'm talking that it's still with me uh, to this day. And I still won't look too deeply into it because it did it on its own. Whoever, whoever directed that movie, they knew what they were doing, you know what I mean? So I just, yeah. It, it reminds me of, uh, it's like one of those basketball injuries where you step on someone's foot and you twist mm-hmm. the ankle. Yeah, same thing. Well, you step on anything, and, and but because yeah. I had on platform boots. That's painful, yeah. Yeah, I had on platform boots, so they weren't real stable. It makes it worse, yeah. No, well, yeah, right, right. Wow. But yeah, uh, made it through that, and uh, it's a great tour. Yeah, the great tour. You know, it's funny. Didn't nobody really ask me too much. None of the guys. Did nobody really say, "Hey, man, how you? How do you? How can, how can you play?" And 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 and. But they would look at me when I was playing, because they just saw me a minute ago. They saw me half an hour ago, and I'm wobbling. I'm creeping. Can't hardly walk. You know what I mean? Now they hear me back there, welling on the welling away on the drums, and they're like. How is he doing it? You know, and I didn't have no, I didn't have no answers. But the smartest guy on that stage was my drum tech because he was so into me. He knew what he needed to do in order to make me, to make it possible for me to do what I had to do. And he, he man, my man to this day, Greg Black. Mm-hmm. What, what what tour was that? Do you remember what record was out? Now, now see, you know what. Uh, 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 so other name, other name, maybe. I'm not sure. I saw it, you, you know. I saw you. Guys, time, I saw uh, you guys on the Monster Rock tour. Mm-hmm. So I'm doing those times. I'm just we're curious if it was going on there. Yeah, we're doing those times. I ping pong between all the acts, so I was. I couldn't focus. I mean, Rubber Band was my my main gig. That was my that was my thing. That was my house. That was my wheelhouse. But I also went out with P Funk whenever we went on hiatus. I also went out to Brides later. At one point, I was on the road four years straight, nonstop. Because whenever one group would go on hiatus, I'd go out with with another. George would always want me to go out with P Funk. And uh like I said, the Brides of Funkistan, whoever else, you know. And then it would always come back to Rubber Band. Whenever the Rubber Band went out, I'm definitely, that was definitely the, what I did, you know. But I stayed out on the road for four years straight, so I kind of lost track. It would have been different if I had just done one thing, mm-hmm. you know. But kind I didn't even focus. Together. Yeah, because I, I couldn't focus too long on one thing because I'm off to the next, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, Cash, let's go back a little bit um, and talk about you know how you first got into drums, why that was your instrument of choice, and how you first connected with you know Bootsy and Catfish. Okay, well, we could start at two years old. I started craving drums at two years old. Wow. Uh, I, there's no answers for that. My 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 folks they they didn't get it because they didn't push me into the arts, you know, they didn't like make me pick up an instrument. They didn't make me rehearse or nothing like that, practice or nothing like that. Uh, I pulled them in, you know, when they saw how driven I was, they they could see that it was something that they needed to take notice to. So it started out with, <clears throat> excuse me, with want, wanting uh, Santa to bring me a set of drums. Okay, it started out with that one. What really tripped my mom and dad out was um, 
I got toys like kids doing it. And after a while, through boredom or whatever, you start tearing your toys up or you just forget about them and leave. But the drums, I left them in pristine condition and I would let nobody go near them, man. If you wouldn't touch my drum, I freaked out. It's the mm. weirdest thing. It was the weirdest thing. And they stay good all year. And then I get another set the next Christmas, right? Uh, 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 and, and my folks, like, I wish, I, wish, I wish I could see some photos of them and how they reacted to the way I was driven. I wish I could see that now because I could imagine it tripped them out because I was, I was just, you know, two years old, two years old, you know? Mm -hmm. And what, 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 what that parlayed into, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit, that parlayed into sticking to that until uh, uh, middle school, elementary school, whatever the case be. And then that's when I first, uh, that's when I was first introduced to acoustic, a real acoustic drum, you know? And from that point on, I was, okay, I was blown away with that, I was driven with that. And then when I got into junior high school, I started studying music theory. And I picked up on it so quick until I went, I moved straight to the head of the class. And I was the youngest drummer, but I was the lead drummer uh, in, in, in the department. And uh, once again, driven, focused, you know, all I knew was whatever my instructor asked me to do or whatever lessons he was trying to, 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 to convey to me, I did it without fail. I mean, I, I bam, like that, you know. So I wound up being the lead drummer and his favorite student because he spent his life learning his craft so he could teach it and share it with kids. And the one thing he gave, he was a funny guy, man. Mr. Andrews, I never forget him. He was no nonsense. He couldn't take any BS. He don't come in there joking around because that's not how he got his craft, learned his craft. But if you really had something special, you were his favorite. You, you. But I've actually seen him like, he actually got in trouble for like hitting kids and stuff like that because he would lose it. You know, he was very, his patience, he had no patience and he had no tolerance for BS, you know. But if you, if you were spot on, you know, you were okay with him. So me and him were good buddies. And um, uh, the one lesson that he, that he taught me, I got a little arrogant. I got a little, I started smelling myself. I started feeling like I, I got this, you know, I, I was in that thing there. And uh, I got too comfortable. I got too relaxed. And this little kid, I think his name was Vance or something like that. Little kid, we went to a, we went to a, a, a thing, contest. They called it contest. Where all, all, all the schools come together in this one city and they compete, you know. And I had a sheet of music. I had a composition that I had to play. And so did this other little student. And uh, he aced it. He waxed it. You know, I half ass did it because I didn't take the time to even say, I mean, I, I, was, I was being arrogant, right? So when we came back to school, uh, my instructor laughed at me because he knew I was heading in, in, in that direction. He knew I needed to learn that lesson. He said, uh huh. He said, what happened? He said, uh huh. You know, see, now you can't do that anymore. You know, you got to stay focused, you, you can't take it for granted. You can't be arrogant, you know, you can't be big headed. You got, and I learned a great lesson uh, from that because the little guy that, that, that beat me out, he wasn't really a great drummer. He wasn't really that, all that into the whole thing. But what he did do on the technical side, he learned the composition. You know, I'm so natural now that I just, I ran through the composition one time, I had it, man. But technically, he kicked my butt, you know, and I learned a great lesson from that. There's some humility. Ex exactly, the exact word, humility. Exactly, exactly. And, 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 it's, and, it, and it's lasted all my life. Humility is key with me. It's key, you know. Um, 
all the way until now I'm very serious about mentoring. You know, that humility has led me into being mentor conscious because I understand now that, hey, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that need information and that want help and that want to be a part of and, and this, that, and the other. And if you got the information, you've been blessed to obtain this information to share, you know, to share and give back. You know what I mean? And like I tell guys now, I say, hey, man, don't let nobody walk up to you and try to ask you a question or talk to you. And then you turn the other way or you act like you don't have time. Just that and the other. I said, no, it's, the, it's your obligation to stop, at least hear what they have to say. And if you can, you know, be an asset to helping them sort out a situation that they might be a little puzzled by. You know, I, I, I preach that every day now, you know, because I understand, man, this world is in turmoil. I mean, this world is in a, in, in a terrible, terrible place. And, and, it, and it is because there was a there was a there, there was a generational lapse to where it's like a blur. Something got lost, and you know, um, back in uh back in my parents' days, they they had they had this thing. It takes a village, mm -hmm. which means you know, like everybody in the neighborhood is gonna help raise you, <laughs> you know, you know, and 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 it's like if you mess up two blocks away. You might get a whooping and then get sent home to get another one. You know, okay, well, that's that's the way it was handled then. Then there was a lapse in the where uh everything went technical, everything went um digital, everything, you know, uh the computerized, all that. And I was telling I was telling a lady friend last night, I said, you know, it's crazy. I said, we were watching some movie or something, and these kids were like really into horsing around outside and playing in the streets, playing no fun playing and uh, in the neighborhood, you know, so everybody was watching them. And, and I said, you know, I said, it's amazing that kids would much rather go to their rooms and shut the door and stay in there than to come outside and experience life and experience the world, you know, and, and, and nature and, and all this kind of thing. And, uh, I said some kind of way things went wrong. You know, I said people don't, are not social. They're not sociable anymore. People don't like to talk. People don't like, you know, and you know all this, you know, and, and it's really crazy, man, because there's so much is lost in translation. Yeah. Or, yeah you, you know, it's terrible, man. It's so, so much lost. What I do, what I do now, uh, without fail, if, I, if I'm approaching you, if you're walking this way and I'm walking that way, if our eyes meet, we're going to speak. I'm going to pull something out of you. You're not going to walk past me without saying hello. You know, mm -hmm. you know, and I, you know, I make people so uncomfortable with that sometimes, unless they get to know me, once they get to know me, they know they're going to speak to me, <laughs> you know, but uh, if, 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 if they don't know me, I'll make them so uncomfortable because they don't want to speak. They don't want to, oh, they don't want to let that, let you in, you know, yeah, and, well, so and, they and, better be prepared if they ever happen to encounter you and they lock eyes, they better have something to say. Oh, and if they don't lock eyes, I, I might I might get their attention and, 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 and just make them say something, you know, yeah. because and then I notice when I when I start doing that, people look forward to, hey, how you doing? Hey, hey, good to see you. Oh, nice day today, huh? Yeah, but, uh -huh. yeah, you know, and, and I'm like, oh, OK, all right. The, now you make me talk. can change. Yeah, you're making me talk more than I really wanted to talk today, but I'll <laughs> talk with you since I start, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's a terrible thing. So mentoring is needed very badly now because there's a whole generation that lost, that got lost in the mix. And they really don't know about communicating. They really don't know about, you know, uh, sharing. You know, me and Boosie laughed one time. Boosie went to McDonald's a while back and they had a thing. And this little box, man, it said, share me knots. <laughs> and I'm like, me and him look at it, we tripped like, damn, they don't went, they don't went this far now. 
it's like just cut cut yourself off from the world, you know. Share me not, you know. Uh, whatever it was, you cannot have none of these Mac Nuggets. These are just for me, you know. It's the selfie, and, selfie world, selfie generation. Oh man, it's it's terrible. But so mentoring, mentoring is is, is vital. It's essential, and it's very much needed. And uh, and I would also suggest it to you. You know, if you as you got information, you got you got bevies of information. You know, if you see anybody that might be curious, that might be lost, that might need a little help, you know, seeking your help, man. Seeking your help, man, because we got to straighten this situation out, man, because it's, it's really pathetic, you know. It, it, it really is sad, you know. Uh, I listen to the radio now, and these little guys, man, are making these songs. I love all, all, all forms of art, so I'm not a Nasser, or I'm not that Oh, that ain't that ain't good stuff. That ain't, I'm not that one. But what I what I am against is the corporate side of it tricking the art side. Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, so the corporate side is saying like, well, all you need is this. Just do this. Don't worry about that. Just give me one chord. You know, and we can make a song out of that. You know, like then the next thing, you know, uh uh uh. I heard this lady say the other day, uh, I hate listening to the radio now because when you listen to one song, you listen to the same song all day long. It's all the same song. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, you know, it's 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 a shame that uh and and those are for the fortunate ones that have experienced uh variety and and and, and, and all these things here. For the ones that haven't they really think that it's as good as it gets. Mm. They really believe it. Yeah. It's really sad. That's, man. Why so, hmm? that's why I'm so glad to be able to expose my son. I have a 13 year old son. Yeah. And I expose him all this. I was just playing him this week, the new Bootsy record. So, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. He's, 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 otherwise he would not know. Well, well talk, talk to his little buddies too. <clears throat> Cause he's not try you, to through him. They, well, we'll try, try, try to do it head spot on because they don't have maybe what he has. He's luck. He's he lucked out. He got a good pops, you know, and knowledgeable. And not only that, you're cool. You on the you on the pulse, you know. Talk to his little guys, you know. Get them together. Some of them not gonna like it. Some of them gonna be boring, you know. But what happens with that? I learned that from childhood. Uh, you get fed information, and it might not be digestible <clears throat> in the moment, but five seven, 10 years from now, he clicks. Oh, that's what he was talking about. So if that's, you know, if that's what it takes to make it important, make it effective, then fine, just do that, but just put it out there anyway. But I'm just, I'm just, I'm kind of like preaching to the choir. You already know what I'm talking about, but we need to do that much, much more, man. And I preach it to the guys, man, because they got the information. I know they do because we came through the ranks together. So I know what we've been through to get to where we at. I know what we've been through. You know what I mean? And like these little guys, they have no idea about how that whole thing worked. Well, how the product, huh? Let's let's talk some more about that. So, uh, well, point is well taken. But I want to get to you know how 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 did you meet Bootsy and Catfish and Talk a little bit well, more that, about, you know, how yeah, you took that lesson forward that you learned from, yeah. from middle school. Well, that's simple. Uh, I'm playing around. I'm playing around town, and uh, I'm playing, 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 playing. So word get word gets out that I can play, and I got drums. That was important, and uh, and uh, so I got to a point to where I was playing with a lot of guys and. I needed more. I wasn't getting what I needed, you know. Uh, and then I, I heard Boosie and Catfish play one day, and I said, "That's what I need right there." And that that was the beginning of it all. It's Cincinnati, Ohio. That was the beginning of it all. About how old were you when you first met them? Uh, we were we were kids, man. We were we were young teenagers, you know. Catfish was the oldest. He was always the uh, pretty much the uh, 
overseer of, of, of the whole thing, you know, because we we made him we made him do that. We made we made him be that guy, you know. So the responsible party, you know what I mean? So you guys, your first band was the Pacemakers. Pacemakers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's funny because it, it didn't have anything to do with heart machines or nothing like that, heart mechanism or nothing like that. <laughs> just, just, just a name that made sense to us. It, it sounded right. And uh, a lot of people think it's pace setters, but it's pacemakers. Um, yeah. Well, it's almost being named after you. I mean, the drummer is the, the pacemaker. Well, okay. You know what? Now that's crazy. <laughs> see what see what I'm saying about being a mentor. You know, I never, ever, ever looked at that that way. <clears throat> that made that made so much sense right then when you said it. You know, I'm gonna run with that one. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> so you got picked up by James Brown. Is there anything in between there that that we should talk about, or just get well? Right? What, what 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 was a lot of stuff? But then that you know you can go on forever with that. We played with this guy, played with that guy, played with this guy, played with that guy. What James did, James had a recording studio. Cincinnati, Ohio, called Kings. He had his management office there. He had, it was he had his distribution there. He uh, he had his pressing plant, you know, because it was all waxed in. And he uh, pressed his own records, and not only that, he had radio sh radio stations. So he pressed his records on, with his label on them, and then sent them to the, to his radio station to break them cross country, nationwide. Uh, James had. People on his roster like Bobby, Bobby, uh, Bobby Bird, uh, Hank Ballard and the Midnighters, Bill Doggett, uh, Vicki Anderson, Marva Whitney. Uh, and we also did something that was pretty uh, far fetched for, for us. We we uh, we did a recording with uh, for uh, Arthur Price. Mm. Arthur Price was this big jazz balladeer along with Billy Eckstein. They, they were like. They were like the cats, you know. And uh, this guy, Henry Glover, he was a producer. He took us in the studio. He said, hey, man, I want y'all to try this thing. And we did this song. It was amazing. And what it was, was this was the first attempt at uh, Arthur Prysock doing soul music. And he was a jazz guy. And it was called I Want to Go Where the Soul Tree Grows. And it was a really amazing song. It was really good. So all um, you guys are on that song? Yeah. Yeah, me well, me catfish and boosie as far as I can remember, and uh, uh, then uh, we every week we we seem to be going out. We would seem to have went out with one artist or another. Like I said, Bill Doggett, Hank Ballard, and Midnighters, blah, blah blah blah. And what James was doing, James would sit in with us before in Cincinnati, just playing around, you know, checking us out actually, and James would keep us under watch by sending us out. We didn't know it was him doing it, but we would always go out with his people on his roster. And uh, make a long story short, uh, uh, we played at a place called The Wine Bar in Cincinnati, Ohio, on a street called Rockdale Avenue in Avondale. <clears throat> and uh, he, uh, we played, we made $14 that night. In total, you know, we had a Dodge Dart station wagon that we could fit all our equipment in, including drums and all of us. That's how skinny we were starving to death. And um, whose car and, was uh, it? It was it was the band car, you know, uh -oh. our car, right, right. And because uh, we get a car, knowing it was gonna break down and just leave it, and you know, we couldn't get nothing fixed, repair. Uh, so we made fourteen dollars that night. In total, and the next day, Bobby Bird had gathered us up, rounded us all up, and put us in the limousine. And uh, when he put us in the limousine, it was the first time ever being in the limousine, first and foremost. And then we went to the airport. Now, we drove down the highway a million and one times and never looked in the direction of the airport because it wasn't in, my, in our vernacular. We didn't know anything about airport and flying and traveling that way. So we're going to the airport and uh, we went to the airport. We flew from Cincinnati to Columbus, Georgia. Uh, when we, we got to Columbus, Georgia, 
James is doing a show at the National Guard Armory. And uh, what happened was the band was doing a quote unquote Mexican standoff with James. They, they, they wanted something, something right for them. They weren't happy about something. They wanted to negotiate with James and sort it out. And what James did, he snuck and had us flown in and they didn't know it. So when we get there, place is sold out, biggest crowd we'd ever seen. When we, when we get there, they shove us in the door, stage door. On the left-hand side, is all our idols. It was Macy, old Fred Wesley, uh, uh, all the cats, you know what I mean? On the right hand side, it was James. And we looking, we trying to digest all this, they're shoving us to the stage. Uh, we get to the stage, we do, it's un unrehearsed. We, uh, James came, because everybody was playing his, song, his music anyway. James came to the stage and counted the songs off. Like, like, Black and Proud, F sharp, one, two, three, four, you know, and then we go and we did a whole set like that. Uh, it was very funny because it was the biggest stage we'd ever been on, biggest crowd we'd ever seen in a venue. We gathered up on this big stage because that's what we always used to, we, we, that's what we were used to, being close like that on stage because we were all in small places. So it was cute. We were gathered up on stage. We did this thing. Afterwards, we came to uh, James' dressing room. He's in there ranting and raving, going off. Bruh, y'all kill me. Bruh, y'all kill me. Boy, y'all did the thing, man. Y'all did the thing. He said, oh, okay. We, it, everything's happening so fast. We, we can't digest half this stuff, right? He said, uh, I think I'm going to give y'all, we ain't talking about being hired or nothing. He said, I think I'm going to give y'all $250. We're like, ooh, we just made 14 bucks, right? Okay. We said, ooh, wow. So we writing it down, you know. He said, no, nah, I think I'm going to give y'all $275. He said, ooh, no, the only, only frame of ref reference we got is Jabbo. Jabbo's the only one that stayed from the other guy. So whenever James would say something, Jabbo would go get, give us drama. Ooh, yeah, ooh, wow, really? Oh, man, that's good. You know, so like, oh, Jabbo said it's cool, so it must be good. So anyway, everybody's playing the game, right? So he said, no, nah, I'm going to give y'all $300. So we're like, ooh, we're blown away now. We are, we know, lost our minds, right? So to make a long story short, we came out of there making something like four hundred fifty dollars a piece. And uh, he said, uh, he said, every time I say something, y'all, y'all start writing something down. What y'all write now? He said, well, Mr. Brown, we gotta see what everybody getting out of those amounts that you quote. He said, no, 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 no. That's what each one of y'all getting. And we done, right? We really done. Fourteen dollars night before, right? Okay, so we got money. We got three brand new sets of uniform. You know, it's ironic that all this stuff is there before we get there. You know, you know, we the least, we the last to know. We were dumb, young, and naive, innocent. You know, but matching shoes, the whole thing, right? The other thing, and James had a truck full of. Uh, Vox equipment, V O X. James and the Beatles were the only ones that had endorsements by this company. And I don't even know if any other artists had endorsements back then, but James had a full endorsement where they were experimenting with him. They every time they come up with something new, uh, they would they would try it out on him. So he had all he had guitars, keyboards, drums, all box stuff. The Beatles had that too. And uh, uh, so we had a truck of brand new equipment. Now, the night before, we could put all our equipment in a Dodge Dart station wagon. Wow. Okay. All right. That's so, overnight success. Okay. Check this out. So, we Dodge Dart station wagon again. Now, we got a Golden Eagles bus to travel on. Never been on the bus. Okay. So, so we got the bus to travel. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to backtrack a little bit. When we went, when we flew from there, the next flight I took, uh, and we were so young, we could, we actually had a uh, we could fly with student passes. I don't even know if they do that anymore. I don't think so. Okay, well, uh, uh, so anyway, uh, so my next flight, it, it felt a little different. You know, I'm like, wow, I wonder why this flight don't feel like the first one we took. And then I flew again. And then it felt like the first one. Now, what it was, my very first flight was in a Learjet. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very first flight was in the Learjet. And the reason it stood out because the Learjet takes off like this. And it's straight up. Like a rocket. You're almost sitting back like a rocket, right? Mm -hmm. The commercial jets, they they gradually incline and then, you know, take off that way. So then I realized, I realized, and I, 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 didn't, I didn't catch that immediately. I realized sometime after, like maybe a year or so later, that my first flight was in a Learjet. You know, I didn't know what a Learjet was, you know what I mean? So anyway, uh, so now with the James Brown, he said, I think I'm going to name y'all the James Brown JBs. Y'all going to be the J because Macy and those guys were the James Brown Orchestra. Mm -hmm. So now we are the original James Brown JBs. That's me, Catfish, Bootsy, uh, Clayton Gunnels, we called him Chicken, and then Robert McCullough, we called him Chop. Clayton played trumpet. Chopper played sax, and uh, we were the original James Brown JBs. And um, needless to say, we pinched ourselves for a couple of months, you know. Yeah. And yeah, that's, that's how that happened. Well, wow, unbelievable. So yeah. it went so fast, though. I mean, it was like a blur. I know uh, Bootsy and them were only there for less than a year, uh, but what a year it was. And then yeah. you were kind of in and out a little bit during that time, right? But well, what I did, I left before them because I couldn't take it. I couldn't take James. James was ruthless. He was a ruthless tyrant. And he treated people very bad. We kind of escaped it because we were so young and stupid until we didn't give a shit about nothing, you know. We did, yeah, whatever. It's like it's like a kid and his uncle. You know, you know, they go uncle, they go uncle, 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 uncle Lewis again, you know. And so we would laugh and and uh we would act like we was taking James serious and then as soon as he turned his back, we'd crack our sides, right? But, but uh, what we didn't like was, especially me, I speak for myself, I didn't like the old heads, the older guys. They were all sad and broken men. You know, and I'm talking about the, I'm not talking about Macy and those guys, I'm talking about like the, the truck driver and uh, the manage, managers and all that cat, those cats and the sound men and all those guys. They were all broken. They, I mean, it wasn't nothing to see one of them break down and start crying. Mm -hmm. You know, spirit was, was broken. Spirit's totally broken. You know, and uh, we didn't know what it was or how to explain it, but we knew it wasn't right, and we knew it wasn't what we got in the game for, and we knew we wouldn't have no fun with it. You know, so. Um, Gradually, we left and, 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 and naturally just came back together, you know. What were you uh, doing, like, you know, when you were out of there? Were you still playing or did you go play yeah. with other people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always played. Yeah. I put, together, I put together a band and it was real nice, really cool. And uh, it was good. As a matter of fact, when Boosie and Kefis came home, we wound up doing a show together. And they loved it, you know, the next thing you know, I was getting that call, you know, like, come on, man, let's, you know, I said, okay, cool. Time? Okay, well, we do it, you know. Mm -hmm. were, were, were there any uh, drummers that you kind of looked up to when you were, you know, just becoming, coming into your own, you know, were Buddy there Rich, any, any Buddy drummers? Rich, Buddy Rich, Buddy Rich, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Buddy Rich, because it's funny how things happen um, uh, in, in one's life. Buddy Rich, because he was the first drummer I ever saw on an album cover. You know, a full-on drummer, drum set. I was a, he's a, and, and that's all, he's a drummer. First time I ever saw that on an album cover was Buddy Rich. So he captivated my attention. And then I took and started listening to him. And then I started following him. And I followed him for years all the way until he was on Carson at one of those shows. And he came clean about the fact, due to the fact that he couldn't read music. And I couldn't believe it. I said, wow. I said, man, you can play all that stuff, man, and can't even read. And, and plus, he was an orchestra leader. You know? You know? But what it was, was that was their style back then. That's what they grew up playing. And, 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 and understand. So that was their thing, you know what I mean? Buddy Rich always 
always blew me away. Plus, he was cool, you know. Yeah, and hard, you know. He was he 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 always blew me away. But it started with the album cover image. That's how I knew him best too. Was seeing him on the Tonight Show in the seventies, and um, yeah, he was fast. He was a fast player. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. He was an arrogant son of a bitch too, <laughs> you know, a badass, you know. Uh, but yeah, man, he was he was one of my favorites all the way through. Um, all time fame. Was there anyone else that kind of got you, you know, in the frame of mind of really being in the pocket and, you know, being in the one? Oh, well, yeah, I was lucky to sit between. See, I was a kid. I, I, I was a young blood between Jabbo and, and Clyde Stubblefield. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, come on, man. You know, I mean, I was a baby, man. But the lessons that I got between that contrast was amazing because Jabbo was clean and straightforward and no nonsense. Clyde was hella funky and hard, powerful. You know, like I got a nice little mix between the two because I understood that although Clyde was playing my kind of thing, he was my kind of, he was that young spirit kind of guy. And he smoked a little weed, he clowned around a lot, chased the girls, and then Jabbo was the, the Mr. Dependable. But what I, really about, what I realized about Jabbo was he was playing most of the stuff, you know. You know, he was the go-to guy, you know what I mean? Clyde was the one that, Clyde was allowed to screw up. He was expected to screw up. He was a screw up. Hmm. But one of the greatest, one of the greatest, you know. Wow.